To talk today about urban artificial intelligence, I'm going to pose three questions. The first question is, what is a city? This is a seemingly simple question, but in fact, people have been studying this for a long time, coming up with different definitions of exactly what is a city. So for today, I could summarize a city as perhaps a complex system, which is more an organism than a, a machine. So maybe a city, in some sense, is alive. It evolves, it changes continually. Maybe it's a myriad of intertwined processes that form a collective, like this one here, you might recall from Star Trek, the Borg. So given this definition, when did cities begin? Well, initially, cities were created by nomads as very temporary structures. They were assembled, and then they eventually got destroyed. Then, as civilization evolved, they started making more permanent structures, like, for instance, in Petra, uh, mountains and uh, buildings inside the mountains. And then on top of mountains, like Machu Picchu in Peru. Today, cities are much more complicated things, like Chicago, New York, Riyadh, or Singapore. There are huge locations with much infrastructure, with water, electricity, communication networks, huge amount of people. They're very, very huge places. So how are cities planned? Let's look back in time a bit to around the 1500s when the Spaniards colonized South America. They had a magic formula which they used to solve this problem. They said, let's put a plaza in the middle. Around a plaza, we're going to put a palace, a plaza, a church, a courthouse, and a prison, and the other blocks give, around, give out to the rich and famous. This was their formula. This doesn't quite work today. Why? Because there's a lot of people. In particular, the last 100 years or so, there's been a great explosion of population. Now there's almost 8 billion people in the world, and it's only continuing to grow. With all these people, and with the inherent complexity of a city, there's problems that arise. For instance, urban sprawl, which is an uncontrolled horizontal growth of a city. There is traffic, of course, vehicular and pedestrians everywhere. There is also pollution caused by the industry and by the city itself. There's also flooding because of the impervious materials in cities. The water that comes from rain, from river, doesn't have a place to go. There's also extreme weather effects that occur in cities, perhaps due to the urban heat island effect. The material in the city changes the local environment. So what can I do? This I started asking myself about 15 years ago. So for today's uh, Ikigai concept, let me think about what it was my Ikigai. How did I go about this? So if you recall, the Ikigai had four dimensions. The first dimension was the mission. So in this case, my mission is very clear. I want to create wonderful cities. Not just better cities and nice cities. I want to create a wonderful city for my kids, my future grandchildren to live in. This is a very clear mission. Then what about passion? So I thought back at my life, and I realized that my passion has always been to build stuff, to solve problems, to make stuff, to design stuff. I always want to build. So if I go back and think with my high school buddies, we put together whatever electronics and computers we could to make robots. That was my passion then. Then I got older, started working in house stuff and making new kitchens, redesigning houses. Then I got into cars and I started rebuilding engines to make them be better. And then with my kids, we started making boats because it's cool to make a boat, right? <laughs> this is stuff that I always am doing. I'm always building, solving, and designing. So that's clearly my passion. The third dimension is vocation. So I recall an article from 1948 from Warren Weaver. He described how science is a significant and very important component of modern life. And in fact, he divided all of the problems of science into three major categories. One of those categories is what he called problems of large problems of organized complexity. 
And cities and biological beings are examples of such problems. And he advocates we should devote ourselves to figuring out, to understanding these problems of science, and that would have a great impact on society. So I, this resonates with me, and therefore a scientist understanding all this is, is my vocation. And then the fourth dimension is profession. So my dad bought me a computer way back some time ago when 4,000 bytes of memory was considered a lot. Today, that's not even one email, right? But that's how things were back then. So I got into electronics, computers in high school. Then I went to college and studied computer science. Then I got a master's in computer science. Then I got a PhD in computer science, a postdoc in computer science, and now I'm an academia in computer science. There might be a trend there you might notice, right? So to the young folks out there, what could I say? Think about your profession, pick something, and stick with it. Get good at it. This can have its advantages. OK, so these things, when I bring them all together, they form my ikigai. All right, let's go back to city planning. This is perhaps one way we can uh, summarize a modern city design and planning pipeline. We begin with modeling, the first stage, where we kind of mill, build a representation of the city. Then we have a simulation, where we simulate what things are happening in the city, and then we visualize, we see the output, we communicate. So let's go into the first one, modeling. So modeling is very hard. These cities I showed you before have a lot of infrastructure. There's many things happening here. So we can't just make a model in a day. It takes months, years, it takes a lot of infrastructure to create a representation of a city so that we can do stuff with it. This is a very hard problem. So one approach has been, you know, countries and governments have satellites that put up around our planet, and we can use these satellites to capture pictures and we can use these pictures to try and create models. So this is the result from a IARPA 2016 challenge, a global challenge to try and reconstruct any part of the world automatically. So this is a wonderful result, but it's not quite where you think we would need to be in the level of detail and the accuracy that we're obtaining about the cities. Then there's the internet. You guys have heard of that before, right? It's this big thing, and there's billions of pictures in the internet that people just around the world have been taking. So one effort from the University of Washington was to automatically go around and collect these pictures of cities and then try to use them to create representations of important places around the world, getting outputs like what you see here from San Marcos Square. While this is great work, it's not quite able to capture also all the detail that we would think we would need. And then finally, there is Google Earth and Google Maps. I'm sure you use this maybe on a daily basis as a way of navigating around. If you turn on the building option, you get some representation of buildings for some cities around the world. It also does not quite have everything. You don't exactly know what's happening on the street, what's happening in the windows, what the building is for. You know, we have some amount of information, but it's not quite there. Let me now go to another dimension, gaming. You know, maybe most of you, some of you, a lot of you play video games. It's cool, it's hot, right? You use game engines, you use companies like Epic Games or Sega and other ones that are around, and games are able to create these very realistic and detailed urban environments that have all these things happening, and it looks great. If we mix in some Hollywood, you know, we get Star Wars, we get huge cities and galaxies far, far away that, you know, how do we even do that, right? I mean, this is a game, we can create it. And we can do Player One, which is some, another game, which is a, well, it's a movie about the future and planet Earth, some alternate reality. I mean, these are all great detailed environments. So clearly we have the ability to create detailed urban environments. So this brings me to a conundrum. If we can create such beautiful buildings and cities for games, why can we not build these for city planning, for designing stuff here on Earth for us today? This is the conundrum I put forth. After some thought, some, time, some years ago, I think a missing link is an urban artificial intelligence. We want to use the latest in data science, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in computers, in science, to have the computer build a model for us of a building of a city. Have it actually build or write the computer program so that we can use it. 
What I mean by this, here's an example. So you have a picture of a building. We want the computer to take the picture and produce the program. In this case, it's called a procedural model that details everything about this building. If we could do this for any building, that would be a very significant ability. And in fact, uh, this ability, because we can create this program, right, then we can change the program. We can, you know, take the computer program, change a couple of lines, and we can alter the building, the reality, and create different versions of this video game of reality, so to speak. So a more complicated building, we start with the actual real building, and we can automatically create variations of it and study what they call what-if scenarios. What if we did this? What if we did that? And this we could do with such an urban artificial intelligence. So this is something that in my lab we've been working on for the last decade or plus. We take pictures, go through multiple stages, end up with this procedural model, this program. We've done this for many buildings around the world, um, but also in many different scenarios besides building. We've also gone city scale. So perhaps uh, here is an example of a city in California where we take in population, road, terrain data, and we create this video game version of this Pacific Grove, California. And if we zoom in on my actual house in this city, in the virtual recreation, my exact house won't be there, but a house which is similar to mine with people of similar input, similar uh, income, similar characteristics will be in this virtual recreation. And this gives us a lot of ability. So here is another one for Chicago, for instance, nearby a huge city. And uh, then we have a, like a flyover of this virtual game-like recreation of Chicago created automatically. And with a program, the details were generated by an urban AI. We've applied this also to, for instance, Toulouse, so in Europe, and also to the tall buildings in San Francisco, for example, and numerous other cities. So now what? If we have this urban AI that allows us to create models, what's the next step? Well, now we can do planning. We can do things we couldn't do before. Let's look at flooding. So in some cities like New Orleans, flooding is a very important. So we want to be able to deal with undesired flooding events. So we can study now what, how the design parameters of this city, like parcel area, setbacks of buildings, road width and road characteristics, how these things, we can alter them to reduce the effect of flooding on the city. And this is something which we have and are continuing to do. What about weather? You know, maybe we want the weather in the city to be a little bit different. We want to curtail it to the local environment. Maybe we want to make it warmer. Maybe we want to make it cooler, right? And we can do this by altering the vegetation pattern around the city. Now, not always can we drastically change the vegetation one day to the other, but we can slowly over time evolve it in some way that produces a more desired weather effect. What about clouds? Maybe you live in Seattle and you, know, you don't like all the clouds. So then we could use this urban AI like we've done in this work here to maybe design the city configuration so that in the morning it's cloudy, in the afternoon it's sunny, and then maybe it's okay for it to be cloudy in the evening again. This is what we mean by being able to use an urban AI to plan how we want to change the city over time. Could also be traffic, as I mentioned before, is one of the major problems in cities. All these people, all these cars, what can we do? So we can explore scenarios of how we could um, change the direction of lanes, move people around, move jobs around progressively, kind of make this happen over time, so to reduce travel time, reduce traffic flow in, in some way that's desirable. So these are some examples of urban AI, urban AI, and it's not just been me. Over the years, there's been um, many professors, in particular my uh, colleague, Dev Yogi, and many students who here have been working on this. And we also operate within a network of hundreds of people around the world who are really, really interested in solving these aspects and making better cities. Now, the urbanization, the fact that people are migrating to cities will only continue so therefore, there's only more and more things that we have to figure out and do. It's not a done deal. It's something we're only scratching the surface of. So this brings me to my third and final question to you today. What is your urban ikigai? Thank you.